Hello everyone. Good evening and welcome to this orthopedic teaching session organized jointly by the FRCS Mentor Group and Orthopedic Research UK. I'm Firas Arnaut and will be modulating the session tonight. The speaker this evening is Mr. Ramon Tamasibi. He's a consultant at King's College in London, specializing in hand, wrist and upper limb surgery. He's been the convener of the King's ORUK Hand Surgery FRCS course since its inception in 2012. He's a dedicated teacher and contributes to numerous postgraduate teaching programs across the UK and Europe. We are very pleased that he has kindly accepted our invitation to teach today. So thank you very much, Firaz. Um, uh, thank you for the kind introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, as you mentioned, I've been involved in teaching for quite a few years, but this is my first webinar. I feel slightly, uh, slightly nervous actually, but uh, excited at the same time. So uh, should we get going with the lecture? Yes, please. If you hover again uh, to the bottom of the screen, um, you will find the manage participants um, option and, and then you could have an option to raise your hand if you want to talk directly or participate. Um, after the meeting, after the uh, lecture, um, we will um, have a hot seat Viva practice session. This, the questions will be asked by various um, post FRCS mentors and one candidate will be on the hot seat and will be given feedback. It will be a real exam life scenario. And these are very limited. And there, I know there are 100 plus participants uh, tonight. So please, if anyone's interested to take part, it's on first come first serve basis. Please express your interest, either send me a message or raise the hand symbol next to your name. And without further ado, I will leave you Mr. Tamasidi now. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, the title of today's talk was officially Essex Lepresti Injuries, but I guess for the purposes of uh, the exam, we need to refer them as uh, longitudinal forearm injuries. Now, these are unusual injuries. They're by no means things that you would see under normal circumstances in a, uh, an ordinary day at work. You may, you may see one, you know, once or twice a year, but the important things about them are, number one, they're really significant injuries. And unless you have good awareness of them, then your, um, your management will uh, be insufficient or incorrect. So one of the purposes of, of today's uh, talk is uh, definitely to try to raise awareness of this particular type of injury. But it is definitely one of these topics that does turn up in the exam for the exact same reasons, because it can catch you out as a clinician, and therefore it's perfect for an examiner to try and catch you out with during uh, a clinical or a viva. It's actually quite a big and a fairly complicated, a fairly postgraduate type of a, a, a subject. And it's definitely one um, to be treated by a specialist or a subspecialist. So the purpose of, of the talk today is to not give you the, the finer details with regard to how, you know, the surgical technique. I mean, for certain things uh, in the trauma viva, you should definitely be able to talk about surgical technique in a lot of detail for certain things which I guess are fairly high up that scale, maybe intramedullary nailing, uh, fixation of a distal radius fracture, um, and you'd be, you'd be uh, actually uh, required to talk about the finer points of surgical technique. I don't think that longitudinal forearm injuries is one of those topics. You need to be familiar with some of the um, uh, potential options for fixation of the, of the injury, uh, but I don't think that you're going to be specifically asked about details. And you'll see why as we go through the talk. It's because um, there is no single best way to treat these. And actually, there's a great deal of variability in how uh, people do treat them. So um, we'll uh, just kick off. Um, uh, so just to introduce myself again, we've already had an introduction. Uh, I work at King's College Hospital, where I'm the uh, lead clinician for orthopedic surgery. I also work at Fortius Clinic London, where I have a specific injury in uh, treating sports injuries of the hand, wrist, elbow. And uh, if you want to get in touch afterwards, you can obviously do so via King's 
uh, and an NHS email address or uh, via my website, which is thehandspecialist.com. So um, the talk is going to be roughly 10 points. And point number one, which is arguably the most important uh, point of all, is that we have to start considering the forearm as a joint. Most people just think it's a kind of a gap between the wrist and the elbow, but actually it really is a uh, unit and it should be considered as a joint. And when you do consider it as a joint, you can understand the pathology and the treatment uh, a great deal better. So there's obviously the proximal radio ulna joint and the distal radio ulna joint with which we're familiar, but the bit in the middle, which we're really going to focus on for the purposes of this talk, is the intraosseous membrane. Now, some people have even gone maybe a step further and they've started to refer this, uh, refer to the intraosseous membrane or the IOM as the middle radio ulna joint because it plays such a pivotal part in maintenance of forearm uh, function and stability. And as we will see, when it is injured, then there are some really significant ramifications uh, in terms of function thereafter that need to be addressed. So uh, Essex Lepresti, it's one of these eponymous names that lots of people have heard about, but the, uh, the syndrome, if you like, is um, characterized by three main things. In every Essex Lepresti injury, there is a radial head fracture. There is some kind of injury to the radius at its proximal end that results in either fracture, dislocation, sometimes both, uh, but invariably, the length of the radius or the radial height, if you like, in respect to the ulna has been uh, changed and it's been shortened. The second uh, pathognomonic injury of the Essex Lepresti is the disruption to the intraosseous membrane. And by disruption, uh, that usually refers to a kind of a tear. And you should consider this in some respects to being like an injury to the syndesmosis in a Weber type C injury. Obviously, you see uh, energy go through one side of the ankle and then exit through the syndesmosis as it exits through the other side. And unless you have recognized the significance of the syndesmotic injury and have taken steps to stabilize it, of course, your Weber C ankle fixation will obviously fail as your, rate, as your um, tibia and your fibula dissociate. So the IOM disruption is key. Thirdly, as the energy um, extends uh, distally, so it's gone from the radial head, it's gone through the intraosseous membrane, which has become torn or ruptured, and then it extends distally and it exits through the distal radial ulna joint. And again, it's really similar to other injuries of the lower limb, a maison nerve type injury being a classic example, where the entire length of the uh, unit between the um, radius and the ulna, or indeed of the tibia and fibula, gets disrupted both proximally and distally. So when you put all of these three things together, uh, you get the longitudinal radio ulna dissociation, or otherwise known as the Essex Lepresti injury. Now, uh, who was Essex Lepresti? Uh, Peter Gordon Essex Lepresti um, was a gentleman who uh, actually unfortunately died very young. He described these injuries whilst he was working uh, in the army during um, just after the Second World War. And uh, he wrote several papers, uh, not just on uh, forearm injuries, but he also wrote a couple of papers on uh, injuries to the os calcis for people who were jumping out of planes. And he was quite a distinguished uh, army doctor, uh, despite his very, very young age. He became a member of the Royal College of Surgeons, I think at 27, and um, uh, died under mysterious circumstances at home in his early 30s. But his name has forever been associated with his first original description uh, of this injury. Here are some of the uh, x-rays that were uh, part of his original paper and you can see that nothing has changed you know in the uh, 70 years since he first described this what we can see in these pictures is there is a fracture of the radius there is some kind of disruption to the proximal radial ulna joint and of course distally you can see that there's uh, gross migration of the radius proximally a significant disruption of the DRUJ probably associated with the fracture in this case as well point number three if we're going to consider um, longitudinal stability of the forearm, the most important structure is in fact the radial head. Now this particular fact has been well established for some time and we know this because of the fact that historically people have tried to undertake radial head excisions in circumstances where um, reconstruction, uh, 
um, replacement or fixation was not possible or degenerative changes had occurred. Now we know that if the um, radial head is excised in a young patient and someone who is high demand and there is some kind of disruption to the proximal radial ulna joint and there is um, diastasis or separation of the two or dissociation, the outcomes are terrible and people do extremely badly. And now we know from experience that this is really only an operation that is reserved for uh, elderly people who are extremely low demand in whom a very cautious resection of the uh, radial head has been undertaken, which is not excessive and not sufficient to destabilize that proximal radial ulna joint. So um, if the radial head has been established as the most important longitudinal stabilizer, then of course, when we are considering longitudinal forearm instability, the key really is to um, replace or at least fix or restore the radial head in some way, shape or form, as that is likely to provide the most significant contribution to uh, longitudinal stability of the forearm in the uh, injured setting. So point number four is that after the radial head, the structure, which is the second most longitudinal stabilizer, is in fact the intraosseous membrane. Um, this is a very uh, clever little study that was done by Hotchkiss, and it effectively measured deformation um, of the radius um, when certain structures had been um, divided. So you can see that the first line up at the top is the amount of uh, deformation um, when you have an intact intraosseous membrane. So what happens is that as you apply load to the forearm, load is shared between the uh, radius and the ulna. The uh, forces are then transmitted in a very uh, controlled manner through the proximal and distal radial ulna joints. And there is very little uh, relative movement between the radius and the ulna. If you simply just resect the TFCC, and of course we are all familiar with the importance of the TFCC in, uh, in regards to um, rotational stability of the forearm, but if you resect the TFCC completely, there's only an 8% reduction in the amount of deformation between the two bones. However, if you resect the intraosseous membrane, then you have a massive 71% reduction uh, in the overall ability of the two bones to um, uh, uh, resist uh, load and diastasis occurs with much less uh, force. The intraosseous membrane is actually a ligament complex. It's not really a single structure. So um, here what we uh, see is a, a specimen with the forearm uh, muscles removed. And we can now start to see that the uh, ligament complex has actually got three bands. Now, the first of these is the most important, and that's the central band. Um, it has this kind of an oblique uh, pathway that runs from one bone to the other, but this orientation of 20 to 24 degrees with respect to the long axis of the ulna is significant because, as we will see later on, the uh, methods of fixation or reconstruction of the intraosseous membrane um, rely quite significantly on restoring that band and that orientation. So that central band is the, the broadest and it's the, I guess, the most important because it's the strongest. Um, the next is the distal cord. Now the distal cord is smaller, but it sits um, just below the uh, ulna head and it, around the metaphysis of the distal radius and the ulna. Now this has a really significant contribution to DRUJ stability. And so when uh, I think quite often, we, we sometimes overlook this because we uh, do fixation of distal radius and distal ulna fractures and people come along with secondary um, DRUJ instability problems. And of course, our natural tendency is to assume that uh, this comes from some kind of TFCC problem. However, if 
your radius has not been anatomically fixed. And quite often what we see is a kind of a radialization of the articular surface, <clears throat> which is very typical of a Colley's fracture. So the um, shaft of the radius moves in an ulnar direction with relation to the um, uh, articular surface. And of course, what that does is it detensions the uh, distal cord. So in the setting that people come along with DRUJ instability after a fracture, yes, of course, you have to uh, uh, consider a TFCC problem or disruption, but have a look at the anatomy of the fracture, have a look at the um, fixation, the potential for malunion, and actually, you will probably find that in a lot of cases, and if, if you are a surgeon who's interested in doing uh, wrist surgery, if you start doing corrective osteotomies, you will find that when you put the, the distal radius back into its correct position, you almost immediately restore DRUJ stability by doing nothing at all to the TFCC. And that's because you have restored the tension in the uh, distal cord. Finally, there is uh, probably a slightly less important but still well-recognized structure, which is the proximal oblique cord. Um, although these are the three structures which have been largely uh, described, there, there's huge variation. And uh, plenty of studies have shown that anatomic variations are the rule. But I guess if you were to look at these uh, four specimens, uh, you would probably still be able to make out a central band in all four specimens and probably a distal and proximal band in most of them as well, with some variations in, the, in between. But certainly the, the consistent structures, I think, are there. So what does the intraosseous membrane do apart from hold the two bones together? Well, we know that it has this uh, function to control forearm pro and supination, and it becomes tense when it is in uh, most tense, when it's in supination. And just like any other ligamentous structure, it has a very important role in um, kinematics. Secondly, I'm, I alluded to this earlier, but it helps to transfer load from the radius to the ulna. Because if that didn't happen, you would have very, very preferential load transfer across one bone or the other, most likely the radius. And we see that in situations where the intraosseous membrane uh, has ruptured and there has been an Essex Lepresti injury and the radius has been, sorry, the radial head has been fixed or replaced. And in the setting that the intraosseous membrane has not been reconstructed, all of the forces subsequently pass through the radius and very little through the armor. And the uh, upshot of that is that you get premature failure of your a radial head replacement or fixation just because the forces are so great and the intraosseous membrane is not allowing that load share, that load transfer onto the ulna. Of course, we have discussed the fact that the IOM is essential for longitudinal stability and for transfer stability. It provides additional stability over and above the ligaments of the proximal radial ulna joint and the distal radial ulna joint. Um, if you uh, look through your forearm anatomy, um, coming up to the exam, you will see that uh, at least half of the forearm muscles have an origin somewhere on the intraosseous membrane. So it's a really important site. And this is potentially one of the reasons why people develop a, a significant lack of grip strength after um, Essex Lepresti injuries. It may well be that the, uh, the proximal anchor to the muscle is now unstable. The final point is not so well proven, but I guess um, it's, it's highly suspected. Like all ligament structures, there is a role for proprioception. And we all know that people who have had, uh, for instance, an ACL rupture or reconstruction have significant proprioception issues and they have to go through quite a lot of uh, rehab to try to restore that after the reconstruction. So moving on now to uh, how we might go about treating these injuries. Point number five is that if you have longitudinal instability, then you have to, if you want to successfully treat it, you have to address it at all levels. And that means that you start off with the radial head and the proximal radial ulna joint that needs to be stabilized. Of course, you need to stabilize the distal end of the joint as well, which involves a DRUJ stabilization and a TFCC repair. But importantly, you have to consider what's in the middle as well. So without addressing all three levels, you may well be insufficiently treating quite a significant injury. 
point number six is your starting point, I guess, for um, any kind of treatment. So the first thing that you have to be able to do is uh, to restore the radial head. And by that, I really mean you have to make sure that the congruence between the uh, proximal radius and ulna has been restored and you have got good proximal radial ulna joint um, alignment. Now, in certain cases, it's difficult, it's harder to achieve that than you would think, mainly because there has been a very significant disruption. Um, it's easy to overstuff or understuff a, a radial head replacement and achieving uh, an accurate restoration. The, the point that I was making is that if um, your radius is short, then it's gonna be very difficult for you to orientate or to reduce your distal radial ulna joint. So obviously everything that happens at the proximal end has a direct influence on what happens at the distal end. And if you don't get that right, uh, and it's very easy to get it wrong, then you have to start thinking about options to change the length of the ulna in order to match that of the radius. And that becomes quite a complicated task, but it's something that we'll be able to uh, talk through in a little bit more detail as we go along. So although restoring the radial uh, height gives um, improvement to your longitudinal stability, it does not restore biomechanics um, because we know that the interosseous membrane has been uh, significantly disrupted. And as I mentioned before, if you do not uh, undertake some kind of interosseous membrane reconstruction, then almost 100% of the forces that get transmitted go through the radius. And of course, that far exceeds the capability of your implant or your fixation to survive those loads. Um, in a few animal uh, or cadaveric studies that have been done, um, if you uh, reconstruct the interosseous membrane, and in this particular one that I've quoted here, you take a, um, an Achilles tendon allograft, um, then all of a sudden you can uh, reduce uh, the force transmission quite significantly and almost uh, achieve a 50% uh, reduction in um, or improvement in low transmission from radius to ulna. So after you have um, done the proximal aspect of your, your surgery, then you can start to think about what's happening more distally. Now, this next step is kind of, uh, I, I guess, simplified for the purposes of, of saying something in the exam. The actual treatment algorithm is somewhat more complicated because at this stage, I'm assuming, or let's just assume for the purposes of this talk, that by fixing the uh, uh, radial head or by replacing the radial head, you have achieved a fairly accurate or anatomic restoration of the length of the radius. And you do not have some kind of length discrepancy between the two bones. Now, if that's the case, then you can proceed on to stabilizing the DRUJ. So at that stage, you would really need to make sure that the, um, uh, the proxy, sorry, the distal radial ulna joint is a congruent. There is no interposition of soft tissue and that the ulna head is sitting very neatly within the sigmoid notch. And at that stage, you would undertake a TFCC repair. Now, for those of you who are not particularly familiar, there's plenty of ways of doing this, but effectively you could either do a dorsal or a lateral type incision. Uh, there are plenty of descriptions of anatomical approaches to the TFCC, and the majority of people now would probably place uh, through an open approach a couple of decent non-absorbable sutures through the periphery of the TFC and then anchor it down uh, to a drill hole that has been made at the fovea, which sits just at the base of the ulna. Those uh, sutures can then be pulled out of the hole uh, and that uh, hole exits on the lateral border of the ulna and then you can do what you like with those sutures thereafter. You can tie them to themselves or uh, lots of people now just use a uh, push lock anchor and uh, secure it into the shaft of the ulna. Now in all of these settings these two tiny stitches are rarely sufficient to really be able to uh, 
uh, maintain decent stability of the DRUJ, the forces going through it are excessive. If you were doing an isolated TFCC repair for some kind of other indication, you would definitely support your repair by placing someone in an above elbow cast. But in the setting where there's been gross disruption of the uh, entire forearm, most people would probably advocate supporting uh, the DRUJ further with one or two K wires that are passed across. You do have to be slightly careful here because if you have then um, passed these two K wires and you're gonna continue your surgery during which you're gonna be pronating and supinating the forearm, you certainly don't want those wires to break. And if they do break, you have to be able to make sure that you can retrieve them. So if you are passing a DRUJ K wire, just make sure that you leave it proud both on the radial side and on the ulna side so that you can uh, retrieve it should it break. And, and for most cases, I recommend that actually you, you don't uh, pass them through until the very end. It's probably one of the final steps of the operation. Otherwise, they are prone to bending and breaking. So then I guess the million dollar question is after you've done the proximal bit and the distal bit, what do you do with a bit in the middle? Well, th there's, there's no best answer here. Um, we know that if the intraosseous membrane is uh, ruptured uh, acutely, then transfer of load cannot occur. Um, then you will have persistent instability. And then in the presence of persistent instability, no ligamentous structure will really ever heal, especially if that's a longitudinal type of uh, translational force. So realistically, if we are hoping to achieve any kind of uh, healing, intrinsic biological healing of the uh, intraosseous membrane, we do have to confer some kind of stability to it. Um, one thing that can help determine the degree of injury is called the radial pull test. And the radial pull test can really be done earlier on uh, at the time of fixation of the uh, radius and the radial head. And uh, there are two ways of doing it, and it's been described in more than one way. The first way is actually just by pulling on the radius at the beginning of the case. So effectively, you take the thumb, you pull on the thumb, and you see whether or not there is uh, greater than uh, six millimeters of um, longitudinal displacement, and that indicates that there has been gross disruption of the intraosseous membrane, the PRUJ and the DRUJ. Equally, a similar test can be undertaken um, using a clamp. So when you've done uh, an approach to the proximal uh, radius or the radial head, you simply take a clamp uh, uh, on the proximal aspect of the shaft, and then you can effectively translate uh, and push the radius backwards and forwards to uh, effectively see whether or, or not the, the translation measures up. So three millimeters indicates that there has been a disruption of some degree that obviously includes the radial head and the DRUJ, but if you have six millimeters or more, as is often the case, then you have a complete disruption of the IOM as well. So as we mentioned before as well, if the membrane does not heal, you're um, in big trouble because then your radial uh, head fixation or replacement will soon fail. And then you are then uh, realistically looking at a patient who's in significant pain, has poor forearm function, and soon after the primary injury, you'll be considering salvage options, which is not ideal. So this has led people um, to consider uh, acute primary intraosseous membrane reconstruction. Um, the, it's not really feasible to stitch it back together, mainly because you would have to peel off all of the muscles of the forearm. It would be an unbelievably difficult thing to do in the acute setting and it's a membranous structure and simply stitching it together, I think, uh, has led to uh, very, very poor results. So this has led people to consider treatment in three main groups. And these are using um, tendon grafts, synthetic grafts and allots. Now, there is no single best way to treat this by any stretch of the imagination. If you look through the literature and uh, prior to this talk, I, I had another look through the, um, the literature People are just presenting, you know, individual case reports or uh, reviews with two or three cases in them uh, outlining a particular technique. And so there are uh, definitely no significant studies that uh, are in significant numbers or have decent long-term outcome data. 
but uh, people have been extremely inventive. And under the banner of um, tendon grafts, people have taken uh, pronator, brachioradialis, ECRL, uh, bone patella tendon bone, palmaris, flexor carpi radialis. Um, the problem with this is obviously donor site morbidity, and sometimes you need quite a big surgical exposure if you're going to take enough graft material. Um, synthetic grafts have also been used. For those of you who uh, do ACJ surgery or perhaps ACL surgery, you'll be familiar with Lars ligaments. Uh, but one device which has certainly become uh, more popular is a, um, uh, a tightrope. Um, we use tightropes again in lots of upper limb surgery. And of course, we're using tightropes in the syndesmosis in the ankle. Uh, they're Arthrex products and they have pros and cons. I guess there's no donor site morbidity, um, but the issue with them is uh, that they are a fixed length. And whereas a biological graft may potentially have the opportunity to uh, stretch with time, that could be a good or a bad thing. Uh, depending on how these synthetic grafts are tensioned, uh, either you get it right first time or you, you're either a bit lax and a bit um, wobbly or a bit too tight and then forearm rotation is significantly restri restricted. Allografts uh, have also been described but these are mainly in cadaver studies but perhaps there is some promising data from fascia lata, tibant, tendo achilles and again bone patella tendon bone. Um, the final picture just here on the right of the screen gives you an idea of roughly how you would orientate your uh, graft and then it becomes kind of like doing an ACL. You uh, pick your spot, you drill your tunnels, you pass your graft and then you secure it. And because of the, um, uh, the, the knowledge that we have regarding the position of the central band of the interosseous membrane, broadly speaking, there are some fairly reliable measurements that we can apply to the forearm in order to um, plan our tunnels. So you'll see that um, the ulna tunnel is uh, located at 33% of the ulna length as a point measured from the tip of the ul ulna styloid and um, the radial tunnel is at 60% of the length of the radius and that gives you the opportunity to try to restore that 21 degree angle which is more or less the orientation of the central band. Um, here are just some uh, pictures. These are not mine. These are taken from one of the numerous studies uh, that describe uh, techniques. Um, and you can see that a free tendon graft uh, has been taken. In this case, I think it's a tibialis anterior. It's been whip stitched at both ends using uh, familiar equipment, which we all use for uh, other indications. You pass a guide wire after you have um, made your uh, measurements, you drill over it, you pass your whip stitched graft through. Um, the the uh, surgical approach to the distal ulna is relatively straightforward. Uh, and as you can see, you effectively come along the subcutaneous border of the ulna uh, and expose the volar structures. The uh, surgical approach to uh, the radius, um, well, to a degree, uh, the radius would have been exposed in order to uh, fix the radial head, but that's not the same um, end point really for the uh, graft that's a bit more distal and so there is uh, I guess a, a dorsal approach between um, the uh, brachioradialis and the uh, ECRL that allows that entry point to be uh, visualized and measured a bit better and then there is a, a kind of a, a, a submuscular um, tunneling that's done of the graft before tensioning and fixation with uh, an arthrex endo button. Now, the important thing is that if you are then going to consider the length of the ulna, you can't really do an ulna shortening after that part of the procedure. You would really significantly compromise your potential reconstruction. So I guess an algorithm for treatment really would be to um, take the patient to theatre, screen before you have uh, done anything else, make sure that you have all of the equipment you, you need and you may need available. Uh, do a radius pull test either open or closed. Fix or replace the radial head and make sure that its congruence with regard to the proximal radial ulna joint is accurate. Then consider whether or not your DRUJ is now the appropriate height and has been reduced. If it has, then you can proceed on to 
um, fixing, firstly, reinforced or prophylactically plated the radius. And that's because there's a considerably, um, there's quite a big tunnel that they've used to place that really big graft. And, and they were obviously um, somewhat concerned about fracture. So they, in this particular case, recommended a prophylactic plating of the radius in order to minimize the risk of fracture. Then they have obviously undertaken an ulna shortening osteotomy, and that's the plate that you can see in the distal ulna. And that has been obviously to, um, to restore the uh, correct, I guess, uh, alignment or the, the, the relative length of the two bones, allowing the DRUJ to reduce. And then finally, you'll be able to see on the distal ulna, there is an endo button, which they have used as part of their uh, reconstruction of the intraosseous membrane. Um, and the uh, corresponding uh, hole can be seen uh, on the radius where the graft exits. Now, in terms of the management of late stage instability, again, there's huge variability. Uh, and, I'm, and I mean variability because there are so many different variables in terms of how patients present and what their problems are. It's by no means a uniform uh, picture or pattern. And uh, as the clinician, you've got to try to unpick the puzzle and figure out which parts of it need to be addressed. But invariably, it's just the same as treating the primary injury. And by that, I mean all three cases, sorry, all three levels still need to be addressed. So you have to be able to restore proximal and distal radio ulna joint stability using whichever methods you feel uh, are at your disposal or d depending on whichever soft or bony tissues uh, you have left for use or for reconstruction. What you can see uh, uh, here is a little annotation. This picture here is uh, an Adams procedure, which is a DRUJ stabilization uh, using a length of tendon uh, that you harvest from wherever you like. Um, and then you effectively drill the uh, ulna hole through the fovea, pass it through the radius, and then tie the graft back onto itself. These days, the more uh, contemporary version of that is to uh, fix the graft within the ulnar tunnel using a biotinodesis screw. The uh, x-ray on the right is a, is a patient of mine who's had a distal radial ulnar joint uh, replacement for a long-standing um, radial ulnar uh, length discrepancy. And uh, the results of that are actually uh, very promising. They, they've been published well and the Sheka is a uh, good implant to use. Um, the, the reason why the, the late stage uh, reconstruction is arguably more relevant than the acute stage is because I think that essex lepresti injuries are still underappreciated. And a couple of studies have shown that the actual uh, um, rate of detection of an essex lepresti in the acute setting is only 33%. So 60 to 70% of Essex Lepresti injuries are unappreciated at the original time of treatment. And that probably means that lots of the patients who you may have already seen who have got a, you know, a radial head fracture and have been treated in isolation for a radial head fracture or a fracture of the distal ulna perhaps, do in fact have an injury to the intraosseous membrane as well. And then as a result, um, these are the patients who come back further down the line with a failed radial head replacement or persistent pain, a prominent ulna, clicking or subluxation or dislocation of the um, DRUJ, or pain around the elbow. And when it comes to um, fixing or addressing chronic problems, it's definitely fair to say that the majority of people are kind of freestyling. Uh, and unless you work in a very uh, big unit that sees a high number of um, upper limb injuries or high energy, injuries or complex problems, you're unlikely really to see many of these uh, in high numbers at all in, in clinical practice uh, outside of those settings. Here are just some further examples of how um, some solutions, um, you know, uh, proximal radial ulna joint reconstruction is a difficult operation uh, and it's by no means something that has reliable medium or long-term um, results. Uh, we have already talked about DRUJ reconstruction, and if you start looking through the literature, you can really take your uh, pick with regard to how you want to uh, reconstruct 
your uh, intraosseous membrane. Um, if you are going to undertake the reconstruction of the membrane, your treatment options are identical to the ones that you would have available in the acute setting. So the techniques are exactly the same ones, but I guess the only difference is the timing of which they are applied and early recognition. And so the, the final point really is that the best treatment of chronic instability is to appreciate the acute instability and apply good treatment in the acute setting. So have a high suspicion, um, uh, index of suspicion of the injury in the acute setting. Certainly every person that you see who has got a radial head fracture, you should be taking a look at the wrist as well, at least examining it uh, to see if there's been any significant disruption to the DRUJ. Um, although you have fixed the radial head in the acute setting, just make sure that it is at the correct uh, length and height and that it is congruent with the proximal radial ulna joint and that you can't pull on it and dissociate it from the uh, proximal ulna. And I'm just going to go back to this uh, slide here and you will see that on this particular um, slide there is obviously a significant injury to the radial head that you can see and so the surgeon has elected to uh, fix that sorry to replace that but if you start to look at that x-ray rather critically the first thing that you will see is that it's um, really significantly overstuffed so the relationship um, between the proximal radius and ulna has been really significantly disrupted the head of the radius is not sitting within the uh, notch of the um, proximal ulna and there is diastasis between the two bones. So under appreciation of that will uh, invariably lead to uh, a late stage problem. Um, if you stabilize the intraosseous membrane uh, and give a little bit of stability, there is a chance that it will heal. Um, there is a trend towards uh, using synthetic devices, whether they're LARS or uh, tight ropes, but the jury is still definitely out and it's dealer's choice. And if you uh, think about the fact that, you know, the, the reoperation rate for these patients is really very high, that if you use a sort of a, uh, a synthetic device with no uh, big dissection and no big donor site morbidity, it still leaves you options further down the line to do a later stage reconstruction using some kind of tendon graft uh, if you wish so that you've got something in the bag. You don't want to necessarily burn all your options in the acute setting and have nowhere to go to further down the line. So and that brings us to the end of the talk. Um, so thank you very much everybody. Uh, I hope uh, you found it useful and I'll um, happily take some questions. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ramon. This is a very comprehensive lecture. We have certainly uh, learned a lot from you today. Um, we definitely appreciate the interosseous membrane a lot more now. And I agree with you, it's underdiagnosed um, uh, injury. Uh, and now we know that if the examiner in the FRCS Viva table shows this radial head fracture, they don't just want us to talk about uh, radial head fracture, they want us to talk more about the stability of the whole forearm, stability of the distal radio ulnar joint, and this way we get higher marks in the exam and um, um, cover the whole topic. Um, and very interesting, you know, interosseous membrane has many other functions, stability, um, its origin of muscles, and also controls the movements. So I, I think talking about these concepts that not everyone knows about is, is, is very important in the exam setting. Uh, and I like the sequence you presented towards the end of, of the steps, uh, we, 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 how do you approach this injury and how to present ourselves in a logical manner in the exam. I think that's, that's a very useful sequence there. And I think um, those guys who joined later, I'll assure you this is recorded and will be posted on the FRCS Mentor um, channel and on ORUK.
for you to go over this. I know some some of us might find some of the concepts explained and they need to be revisited again. So I think we'll have another chance. Um, Ramon, I just have a question, um, if you don't mind. I think you touched on uh, quite comprehensively covered the whole topic. Um, but I have a question from uh, Robert who, who asked, um, what would be the best clinical test um, to assess for interosseous membrane injury? Um, I know you said about the radial pull test, but um, I think you wanted to know if there's any other clinical test you could do in clinic, if, you know, or, or something like this. Um, I think that in the acute setting, it's very difficult because um, the the clinical signs are are not prominent, but you will find that the person who's turned up with a seemingly isolated uh, injury to their elbow has got um, an asymmetry to their distal radial ulnar joints. So you will see that the distal ulnar on one side is much more prominent than it is on the other. They will also have wrist pain or forearm pain as well. Um, but because of the fact that they have had such a significant injury, like a meaningful clinical examination beyond that is really difficult. Um, so in the same way that someone has a fracture of the uh, medial malleolus and you're suspicious that they have a mesial nerve injury, you can palpate around the fibula head, but ultimately you're looking for a radiographic um, uh, confirmation. So if you have taken that X-ray of the elbow and you are clinically suspicious or on that X-ray you have seen that there is perhaps more of a disruption to the proximal radial ulnar joint than there should be for an isolated PIJ or the mechanism of injury uh, doesn't quite fit. So it was a high energy injury, a fall from height, falling out onto an outstretched hand, then you can also just be a bit more suspicious and confirm everything with an x-ray of the forearm and the wrist. And I think when you put it all together, you're much more likely to, to pick it up rather than on clinical grounds alone. That's lovely. Just before I forget also, I would like to thank ORUK for helping us to host this session. Uh, we couldn't have run it and, and distributed it so uh, widely without their input. And I, I, oh, I think, oh, I, by I the think... way, Faraz, I, was, I haven't finished my presentation. I just remembered something. Yeah. I, I had a couple of slides to present at the end. Shall I do that? Yes, please, if you don't mind. Take the patient to, to theatre, do your radial pull test, fix the radial head, then um, reduce the DRUJ. And at that stage, you really have to make a decision as to whether or not you have restored adequately the length of the radius because if you have not then you have very limited options and what you don't want to do is to stabilize the radius and the ulna if the PRUJ or the DRUJ are subluxed or dislocated. If you have not been able to really accurately restore the length of the, uh, the radius and at this stage as well if you're really suspicious you should screen the contralateral side because your patient may not be um, uh, ulnar neutral variants. It could be positive or negative physiologically. So compared to the other side. And if you have got um, a suspicion that you're not going to make it all fit, then at that stage, you really need to think about shortening the ulna in the acute setting um, because you need to do that first before you consider the intraosseous membrane reconstruction. So after you have made the two fit, then uh, stabilize proximally and distally, do a TFCC repair and consider stabilizing that at the end with a transverse K-wire. And then we talked about doing the intraosseous membrane augmentation, whichever way, uh, whichever way you, would, uh, you would like to. Is to thank ORUK um, for a couple of reasons, really, and mainly because they've been fantastic partners of mine over the past few years. Um, I hope that some of the people who are on this webinar this evening have had the chance to uh, come to one of my courses or perhaps one of the courses that ORUK run in conjunction with the people in London because there's a, a huge fantastic postgraduate um, uh, training program that they have supported over many years and uh, not just with me but lots of my colleagues uh, from other London hospitals as well. So um, we, we run courses uh, that uh, have helped innumerable people really uh, pass the FRCS course and without their support we as teachers really wouldn't have been able to do the things that, that we enjoy, uh, do, enjoy doing uh, such as helping trainees uh, along their career paths. They also um, 
published some pretty good revision books and um, I'm hoping next year uh, to be uh, part of this illustrious group of people who have uh, collaborated with ORUK to publish books and hopefully um, you'll see something from me with regard to uh, hand surgery for the FRCS fourth exam but there's an excellent basic science book um, and a, an excellent clinical science book for the exam um, and for those of you who are interested in research uh, just to highlight that over the past few years, well, pe well, since 2004, um, ORUK have given away nearly 10 million pounds in uh, awards, uh, grants, and um, uh, they've supported people doing independent um, uh, research at all levels, whether it's basic science or clinical or molecular uh, uh, across the country. And they are a charity, so they rely on everyone's uh, kindness, uh, and if anyone is interested in supporting ORUK, then of course uh, uh, they can do um, through the website. I have one more, uh, just one more fine, one more question, Sanish. Um, it's about how, how's the best way intraoperatively uh, for image intensifier to assess the douche stability? Is there any, you know, because sometimes you see a little bit of subluxation or what looks like subluxation, not sure is it true subluxation, should I be doing something, is it stable or unstable? Is there any, any like a um, hint on that? Yes. Um, uh, so there's a couple of things really, and, and I guess um, w one way of doing it really is to make sure that when you're doing your x-rays, and this is not just true for Essex Lepresti injuries, this is a top tip for um, fixing distal radius fractures in general. Quite often, we're fixing a distal radius fracture through a volar approach. And so obviously, the arm is uh, supinated and here's our incision along FCR. So at the time that the x-ray is being wheeled in, the uh, forearm is in supination and the wrist x-ray is done as an anteroposterior x-ray. Now, I think that um, it's actually quite difficult to judge the DRUJ through an AP X-ray. And if uh, you uh, pronate and do a PA, the PA X-ray is the one that we are all familiar with seeing on our X-rays. That's the one that's done in the department by the radiographers, and that's done with the arm in full pronation. Now, the difference between the two will become increasingly obvious the more you do it. You'll see that the position of the ulnar styloid changes, the orientation of the distal radius with regard to the ulnar changes. And then if on the table, you undertake very gentle but subtle um, changes in the forearm uh, rotation, what you're really looking for is um, the equivalent of a mortise view. Now, we are all very familiar with trying to assess whether or not the ankle is perhaps reduced, whether the medial malleolus is on or off, whether there is uh, instability of the syndesmosis, and everybody will be able to look at the x-ray of the ankle and say, this isn't a mortise view. We say that all the time, don't we? We go, this is not a mortise view, the rotation of this x-ray is not correct, therefore we cannot make any judgments regarding the reduction of the fracture or the position of the distal fibula with relation to the distal tibia. And actually the, true, the same is true of the DRUJ. So next time you're fixing a distal radius, pronate the forearm, and then just try to get an X-ray that allows you to shoot all the way through the DRUJ without significant overlap, and then with a little bit of tension and traction, you'll be able to see at that stage whether or not the two dissociate. If in the case of a um, intraosseous membrane uh, injury, you just put a clip, uh, a sharp or a blunt clip on the distal ulna, you'll be able to pull it and you'll see a diastasis between the two. Otherwise, you'll be able to see perhaps a subtle separation in a distal radius fracture that hasn't been properly reduced or at that stage you do a clinical assessment on the table at the end of your ORIF distal radius and if you have gross instability at that time mm -hmm. 
the, the likeliest cause is actually a malro malreduction of your radius. If you find that your DRUJ is, is wobbly, um, don't, don't immediately assume that it's a TFCC problem. Be really, really critical of your reduction because a disruption to the distal oblique band of the intraosseous membrane that has been caused by a reduction in its tension through malreduction will be as significant as an injury to the TFCC. Thank you. I think you, you did touch on this uh, on your presentation when you said reduction is very important and, and it achieves a, um, it plays an important part to achieve stability. So um, yeah. I think that, that's the key. I think now just one more question. I know you have another meeting uh, to go to. I do. Is there a time for one more question? Yes, or there is. There is. You go, so that'll be a quick one. So you got the question from, from uh, uh, Susanna. She said, now, so basically now we're sailing through this question in the exam. We went through various ass assessments, uh, operative fixation, um, various more. And now the, the question is, how do you rehabilitate? Is there any particular um, points here, rehabilitation, anything in particular? We should avoid any particular movements or... No, I, I think that the key is really not to load the forearm in any particular way. The, um, the, the aim of all of this is obviously to get the forearm moving as soon as possible, because otherwise with a scale of injury like this, you would certainly um, find that stiffness sets in. If you do what we all do and keep the patient in an above elbow plaster because you're overly cautious, uh, the forearm will never move again. So I think uh, no specifics, early mobilization if you're um, brave enough, uh, and you feel that your reconstruction has been good enough, passive range in your uh, forearm uh, as soon as possible, but without load. So the, the loading has to be a very, very late stage thing. You know if you've got your wires in situ, but if you've achieved an early stabilization through a good intraosseous membrane fixation, then uh, the answer is yes, you do have to load um, or, or get it moving relatively early because otherwise you will be fixed in uh, in quite significant um, fixed rotation, uh, but definitely if you have undertaken um, a DRUJ fixation with wires, you will certainly not be able to, uh, to mobilize that at all until the wires are out. Probably Ramon, thank you very much. We really appreciate uh, your, you kindly accepted uh, our invitation to teach today. So we thank you very much. And we thank the team from ORUK um, we've learned a lot and we hope to see you again with us um, either in another teaching session or in a Viva practice session whenever your time allows. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, for other guys, please um, uh, don't log off. Now the recording is.